All right, let's spend a few minutes reviewing what we went over last time, and then we'll delve into some more involved programming, programming where our next big thing, after we've seen the pieces of an Android our app, our next big thing will be to look to see how the pieces talk to each other. In other words, how I can write code to access and manipulate the different elements of the user interface. Because um, that, that's obviously a key, key thing, you know, um, hello world applications only get you so far. It's funny, I, I, I was thinking back and from what, given that mine were on punch cards, my first programs, I don't think Hello World was like the standard for the first program. So I wonder what my first program did. I'll bet it did something like calculate the area of a square or a rectangle or something like that. If only we had those cards, that we could we could ship them to the Smithsonian. Um, all right, let's look at the welcome example, which is the example that we were looking at last time. And I want to review <coughs> the different pieces. And we'll probably review the different pieces of the app several times till it becomes like a second nature. Because it can be confusing. That's the one disadvantage of, of sort of the component style of programming instead of those big monolithic programs in, uh, in the past is that you have to figure out where stuff is, all right, and where you have to put stuff. All right, so I open up in Eclipse. <laughs> And here is our welcome, and we looked at a couple pieces. We looked at the Java, which is a code that represents the activity. We looked at the resources. We spent a little fair amount of time talking about the resources. And we looked at the manifest. And I think the manifest I kind of shortchanged. I didn't go over that in too much detail. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about the manifest. All right, let's look at the manifest. The manifest, and again, I almost always go to the code view as opposed to the view within the GUI. And I will copy and paste this into a uh, text editor so that we can see it, because I know that it's a little hard to read. Even with my new glasses, it's a little hard to read. Imagine how it was last semester when I didn't have my new glasses. And it's really a struggle. All right. Like many of these files that are associated with an Android app, it's in a XML format, all right? And again, XML is flexible enough. The X in XML stands for extensible, which means that it can be extended. You're able to extend it. And so if, you, if you're, you know, people making the Android framework created XML formats for their certain needs, and one of them is the manifest. All right, this simply defines as a manifest. This talks about the minimum SDK version that you want to be able to run it on. In this case, we went down to seven. If you remember, that's what was wrong when I tried to run it before. It didn't, it didn't recognize my one phone because it had a lower version than that. So it didn't, didn't know it exists. Essentially, a lot of this stuff is the stuff that is going to happen when the application fires off. All right, saying that we have an application, we've pointed to the icon. We'll spend a minute looking at the icon uh, in a couple minutes. The label that we're going to have is from the app name. Notice that is from the string resource file. That way we can, again, we can give an app name for different countries. We can, we can call the same thing um, different 
in different countries simply by creating a resource file for the languages. This talks about the activity. The activity name is welcome. That's the label we're going to use for it. And then there are intent filters. And these are just the basic things to sort of get this going. But later on, an intent is like when an Android app wants to go and do something. Like, for example, if you wanted to, if you were writing an email on your Android device and you wanted to attach an image, you would go to a photo, at, you know, you'd go to your photo gallery. Saying that I want to see the photos in my photo gallery, when the application says that, that's an intent. Okay? The application intends to do something. And more than one application can, uh, I'm sorry, they, um, I, was I saying that backwards? No, I think I was saying that right. More than one application can handle a specific intent. For example, if I want to open an image on my Android device, It'll give me a choice because I have several applications that can open, handle opening images. If you have um, Twitter uh, installed on your device, if you go to within, uh, you know, uh, if your application has the intent of opening up Twitter and looking for something, it will ask you, do you want to use the browser or do you want to use Twitter? So, generally speaking, when you have more than one application that handles an intent, It'll ask you which one you want to use, and then you can make that permanent by simply checking the right checkbox. At any rate, these are the things that are sort of set up. This one is, is as plain of, an intent, of a, a manifest as possible as just to make sure that this guy um, gets running. If we notice, again, the main activity associated with this is called welcome, and that corresponds to welcome.java. All right, if you noticed, the icon comes from a resource file, drawable icon. If we look here, notice we actually have four drawable fol folders. What are the things after the dash called? I know, letters, but more specifically, what are the things after the dash called? Remember, we did it with Spanish and French and all that. It's the basically, I would consider like the overload of each one of them. An overload? That, that, that's a good analogy, function yeah. overload. I remember exactly what you called it. Right. They're right. called qualifiers? They're called resource qualifiers. Um, in a nutshell, and, and, you know, I'm not huge on terminology. You know, I don't insist that you have, you know, certain terms memorized and all that. But it is useful if you're Googling. Right? Um, you know, it's a lot easier to Google Android resource qualifiers than Android, those strings of letters that appear after the dash in those folders. You know, you're, you're liable to get better results that way. Notice we have four drawable folders. And the resource qualifiers are HDPI, LDPI, MDPI, and XHDPI. What do you suppose that means? What does HDPI, LDPI, MDPI, XHD? Exactly. High density, low density, medium density, and extra density. What do we mean by the, the pixel density? The pixels per square inch, basically. Yeah, pixels per square inch, right. And again, this is confusing to some students, and to be honest, it was confusing with me. A lot of times, your gut reaction is to say, well, the screen size. No, it's not the screen size, it's the screen density. All right? And it changes. Pardon me? And it changes. Right. I think that's probably one of the fastest changing things I've seen in technology in a long time. Oh, right, right, absolutely. Within two years, you quadrupled the amount right. of Right, right. It's funny, when I created this, you know, when I first started teaching this class, they didn't do any of the XHDPI, and they're doing that now. Yeah. Let's talk about what that means and why we have three files. Because if we looked at, we don't have one for the extra high density. I turned the screen off just a little too quick. 
In each of these three folders, there is a folder called icon.png. I'm, I'm sorry, not a folder, but a file called icon.png. Why do we have three icons? It relates to the screen density. All right. Medium density is considered within Android to be 160 dots per inch. So, you know, with drawing with great magnification, if this was an inch, it would be 160 dots. So that's medium. That's like the baseline. All right. Usually you think of things in terms of, of you know, medium, then lower than the medium, higher than the medium. Low density is considered to be like 120 dpi. And high density is considered to be So if medium density was that, low density would mean per inch, there's less of them, and high density would mean per inch, there's more of them. All right? I think I got those numbers right, but I'm feeling unsure myself right at this second. So I am going to... And then you, you said that's in a straight line. No, it's, it's, you're right, it's linear. Okay. Developer.android.com is a great resource, um, by the way. Yeah. Um, LDPI is 120 DPI. Um, medium is 160, HDPI is 240, extra HDPI is 320, extra extra is 480, extra 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 high density is 640. All right. It's only going to get worse. Yeah, right. And then, <laughs> then they're going to like be adding, you know, the, I don't know, I have to invent another letter to go beyond extra. Super. Yeah. I'm kind of wondering after a point, I mean, I understand uh, how this contributes to a certain quality of resolution, but when you get, when you get a pixel dose and you have a certain uh, rate, um, human eye can't actually... Yeah, and, and I was... So I, I'm kind of wondering what right. the point of that is. Right, right. Yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, that's true. And, and I wonder, definitely for me, I wonder what that density is. They probably already have passed it in the way with, with my eyesight. Now let's think about this for a second. Because this is a little counterintuitive for some people. All right? Let's say I have an image, and we'll keep it easy. We'll say it's 100 pixel square. So it's 100 pixel by 100 pixel. On which one of these densities would that image display the largest? And which one would it display the smallest? The high density would show the smallest, and the low density would show the largest. Yeah, the high density it would show the smallest. The high density or the low density it would show the biggest. Why is that? Well, again, if you look at these, the dots are close together. So 100 dots close together. Is going to be bit, is going to be smaller than a hundred dots that are spread out. So, for that reason, you do a couple things. One of the things that you do is that you um, provide alternate images for different densities, and you do that for the icon, and you can do that for other things as well. You don't have to, but you can. All right. So, we're going to look at the icon files. And the icon files follow this ratio. I, 
know you can't see it. I'm just pulling it up so I can see how big it is. Medium density icons, I'm sorry, high density icons are 72 by 72. All right. Medium density icons are. And this is because the, the icon itself on the desktop of an Android is a preset size. You want it to be a, you want it to be a constant size regardless of the screen density. That's right. Right. Medium density is 48 by 48. And low density would be 36 by 36. So we have in this application, and we'll see the files in a minute, we have three icons. And each of the icons is in the appropriate folder for that resource qualifier. These should all be the same size. In other words, a 36 by 36 pixel icon displayed on a low density screen is going to be approximately the same size as a 48 by 48 displayed on a medium density and approximately the same size as a 72 by 72 displayed on a high density. You know, what do you get with the high density? Well, you have in the same physical space, you have more pixels, therefore it's better quality image. All right, you can see the image uh, um, that there's a better quality. All right, so again, if you had an image that was 200 pixels, let's say, you have a medium density screen and you have this image that looks fine, and you find it's 200 pixels, what you would want to do is this. The image was 200 pixels. You would multiply by 120 over 160. Didn't know you'd have to do math today, did you? All right. And that turns out to be Force. And so to make it appear the same size on a low density, it would be 150 pixels. What about on a high density? 200 pixels times 240 over 160, which is 3 over 2, which would be 300 pixels. I always know I've done the math right because the high density is going to be twice the low density. So that's, that's sort of my sanity check. Is, is there any software that you recommend or do you know if there is any that would automatically change the resolution of images for you in case you created an image and you didn't feel like going back and editing it yourself or you're not really worried about that? <laughs> I wouldn't worry about that. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would take the 15 seconds to go and resize it and say save as. Oh, so, oh, I got you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like if I had an icon, if I, if I made an icon and I was very happy with what I had, I would go and save it as, save it as 36 by 36, save it as 48 by 48, save it as 72. You start with the bigger I was I was thinking of a much more complicated way right. of doing it. Right. <laughs> And again, it's like with the resource files, the nice thing is, is if you do this, if you put these in place, the Android operating system picks the right one. All right. So because of that, you'll notice that any of the images that we have, or any of the icons we have, not necessarily all the images, there's a drawable.ldpi folder, a drawable dash MDPI and a drawable HDPI. All right. So that's one thing that we do to handle the fact that there are different screen resolutions. We create multiple 
versions of the image and then use the resource qualifiers to put the appropriate one in. The second thing we do, that's all well and good for images, but what about things like text boxes? If I want a text box this big on the screen, well, if I use pixels to size the text box, if I said I wanted a 100 pixel text box, again, be an itty bitty text box on a high resolution machine, high, uh, high density pixels, it would be medium size on medium and it would be gigantic on a low density one. So the other thing that we do is we express sizes not in pixels, but DPI, which is called uh, um, um, density, I, I might have that abbreviation, it's but it's density, DIP, right, density independent pixels, all right? So if I knew that 200 pixels wide was the size that I wanted my text box to be on a medium device, what would I do? Well, again, I wouldn't have to go in and specify resource qualifiers for that. I could simply say, I want that width to be 200 dp, instead of saying pixels. And Android will automatically size it the right size for the particular device. So let's take a look at those two things. Let's take a look at the icons, and let's take a look at using dp. Here's, oh, it takes a second here. Here, if you notice, are the three folders, drawable HDPI, drawable LDPI, drawable MDPI. If we look at the medium one, the medium one is... Forty-eight by forty-eight. The high density is. All right. The question is: Is how far into the end of the semester before I have this dual screen bit down? The high density is going to be what? It's going to be bigger than that, right? Because for it to be the same size physically on the screen. You need more pixels because the pixels are closer together. And sure enough, this is 72. And a 72 to 48 is the same ratio as the 240 to 160. It's four thirds. No, three halves. Yeah. And then lastly, this is like this is like the three bears, right? You got little icon, big icon, little icon, and little baby icon. On the low density one, if you notice that physically looks smaller, and sure enough it's 36 by 36. All right. Okay, so that's a thing to keep in mind. They could have done that with these other images, with the bug, and with the little Android robot guy. But they decided that wasn't important. All right, so, eh. All right, let's look at our main XML. And again, I'm going to bring that main XML, always look at the code view. find an example of this and only thing I see 
is this label, the size given is 40 SP. All right, what's SP? SP is, is standard pixel, which is really very similar to density independent pixel. So SP is just a, uh, just a slightly different variation that's used for text. But notice it's not PX for absolute pixels. You can specify sizes in absolute pixels, but that's not a good idea. All right, let's look at this. This uses a relative layout. And with the relative layout, what that means is for each control, you specify where that control lives in relation to the other controls. So, in this one, this is kind of the starting point. The label, it says, welcome to the Android class. How big should it be? Wrap content. That means make it big enough to fit the, con the, the content. Text is where the text is going to come from. Size is how big the size of the text is going to be. An ID. We are going to use these IDs later when we start programming. All right. Um, if any of you have done things in uh, JavaScript, or if you've done things in ASP.NET, you know that for your controls, you put IDs on them so that you can reference them later to do something with them. It's no different here. We have an ID associated with this, all right? Um, and then later on, if we were to write code, we could address that particular element and do something with it. Text color, layout things. Oh, here we go, margin, 10 dp. That's density independent pixels. All right. <laughs> it, you, I do believe you can actually do it both ways. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and probably, you know, people were making fun of dip and all that. So, you know, like the old BC cartoon, Dip in the Road. I don't know if you've seen that one. But so anyhow, image view. All right. These are different views. Text view is where you have text. Image view is where you have an image. We specify all these other attributes of it. We say the layout is below that ID. So in other words, that's why this guy, the picture of the little Android robot guy, is underneath the label because we said the layout for this is below that text view. Likewise, we said this next one, the little bug, that I guess is Deedle symbol. All right. I think I put two of these in here just for laughs. But the little bug is below the droid image view. So if we look at this, remember last time. And I think I was smart and brought my Android device. was at a, a seminar and you know teachers make the worst audience because that's what I was doing the whole time so I was playing on my phone I was checking email and posting to Facebook and all that kind of stuff <laughs> and someone asked me oh are you looking at the mobile view of this website and I'm like no <laughs> if I was smarter I would have lied and, and said yes all right anyhow here's how we go Oops. again the text the robot guy, the little android guy is underneath it, and then the bug is underneath that. That's what you mean by relative layout. You specify things positioned in relation to other things. All right. And last but not least, we have our code. 
which if you remember from last time, really didn't do much of anything other than when this is created, it sets the content view of our layout main. In other words, it grabs the right main XML file and makes that the view associated with this, um, with this activity. And again, notice we don't have to have code in there. We don't have to have if statements to say if the language is French, use this one. If the language is French, that happens automatically. When I say set content view r.layout main, it will look to see what the language and other parameters of the user's system is, and then it will look for a resource qualified folder that matches that. So since this is just in plain English, it would find values as opposed to what we did last time when we changed it to Spanish, it found the values ES. Questions on this? All right, the next example I have is a little more involved, not terribly involved, but a little more involved. And let's run it. Okay. Let's see what it looks like. Yeah, go ahead. I have a question actually for you. Can we, I, I was going to save this for, um, for lab to ask you if we could do it, but can you show us how you will load a file onto Eclipse similar to what you would do, like a pre existing project? Yeah, actually, I got a question too. After I loaded the tip calculator project, I couldn't find the um, two of the files you were asking us to take screenshots. Okay. I found the, uh, the function okay. source. Uh, but the, the Only can listen to one person at a time. <laughs> uh, I uh, let, Let's do that. I'll go actually and delete this guy, and we'll redo it. Yeah, because that was one of the things. Uh, it's new. Uh, Eclipse is new to me, and I'm okay. staring at both of them because I downloaded Studio, Android Studio, and Eclipse. Great question. I think they work very similar in this regard, but you go in and say file, import. All right. Existing code into existing Android code in the workspace. That's the one you'll take if you have the files, like if you downloaded my examples or if you have the Deedle examples. You click next. So will you always put your pre existing code into that folder then? You know what I mean? In what folder? This is a, these aren't really folders. These look like folders, but these are more like options. Okay. In other words, I mean, general would be like, you know, the, these aren't, even though they look like folders, they're not really folders. So these could be anywhere. You browse to where okay. that is. So you click next. I'll click and find the root directory. All right. And in this case... This is the example I want to go over now, called example two. It has a folder that contains the bin and the SRC and the RES and, and GEN and assets. All right. And then I'll click open and then finish. And then it brings it into my Android. Right. Now, your question was uh, a uh, couple uh, files? Uh, yeah, it would be main XML and uh, it's um, tipcalculator.java. Okay. Um, I couldn't find those ones, but I did find a main activity.xml okay, that appears to be the same difference. And also, um, when I went to like, just uh, regular main activity.java, okay, mm -hmm. that's actually got the source code. Okay. So that, that might have been a typo for me. May, you know, I might have said... Okay. It might have been changed on the author's end. That's a possibility. And, and the main XML file, um, and again, maybe I typoed or maybe they made a change, that would be, it would be the XML file that's in the layout folder. Uh, yeah, because so, I'm looking in the right place. Okay. Just yeah, so, so, no, that's fine. That's fine. Really, the, the whole idea of this is just, you know, a test of you navigating through a clip, so. Yeah, you, all right, sounds good. All right, so we got this one. Let's go and run it, and let's see what it does, and then we will talk about it. 
All right. Again, it's telling me I can't find something with a I suspect, yeah, I, I, I didn't have it plugged in right. That's the other thing you need to do. Besides the right version of the API, you actually have to plug it in right in the USB. All right, so I'm going to run it on this device. I'll click OK. All right. This calculator, very simple. We have We'll watch, we'll, we'll, we'll look through this and we'll change it. There's a place for you to put in the amount of your meal. So, $32. There's a place for you to say whether your service is poor, average, or excellent. I'll say it was excellent. There's a checkbox saying whether it's breakfast or not. I don't know, this isn't my personal policy, but it seems like people tip less for breakfast than they do <laughs> for other meals. I just want to put a checkbox in the code, all right? And then there's a calculate button, to calculate tip. So I'll click that, and it says that it should be $6.40 of a tip. I think the way I have it is for excellent, I'm giving 20%, for average, I'm giving 15%, and then for poor, I'm giving zero. Ooh, cranky customer. We're going to spend your food next time if you don't tip for the list time or something. No, they'll never remember you. I, I do have a distinct <laughs> look. So, <laughs> yeah. But, but the better question is, is if, I, if they gave me poor service, why would I go back? So. Because they gave you free food for your poor service. Oh, well, then, try then it's no longer a poor <laughs> service. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, I knew some folks that did that. That was like a sport for them. Just to complain. To look for something to complain about to try to get some kind of discount. And it's kind of like, well, you know, I shouldn't judge until I get to be their age, you know. But, yeah, it seemed to be kind of like a sport for them. But, again, pretty simple. Nothing earth shattering about this. But what's different about this is this actually has some code that does something instead of just popping up the screen. In other words, based on the user input, when you click the button, something happens. All right? So what I want to do today is I want to go through, uh, what I want to do the rest of, of the lecture today is go through and look at the same things we looked at last time. And we're going to end up probably spending the most time for this example um, in the, uh, the, the actual Java code itself. All right? Because the Java code itself is where the action really is. All right. So, let's look at this. Let's start, look at the manifest. Pretty much the same as the other manifest. Again, because we're not doing anything too fancy in here. So our manifests are pretty simple. One thing that does go in the manifest, that again, isn't really relevant for these examples, but you put in the manifest um, permissions that you want the user to grant your application. How many of you have an Android device? Uh, and and you, so you've installed software on it. It will say something like, this, uh, this app will, wants to know your location. This app wants to see your contact list. And it will show you a list of things that, and then you click OK. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Or wait a minute, you know, I don't, I don't want this application reading my contact list or whatever. And then you can, but the idea is, is that they tell you in advance that they're doing that. All right, and that that's a that provides a little bit of of security. All right, you put those sorts of things in the Android manifest. If you're doing something, if you're, for example, integrating with the camera or integrating with the contact list or something like that, you'd put that kind of stuff in there. All right, so nothing earth shattering in there. The drawables, I have three versions of the icon. Same things apply as applied there, so we won't spend much time talking about them. I have a main XML for the layout, 
And then finally, I have a strings.xml for all my labels. All right. And again, I can put these labels in, and uh, it's very easy to maintain because all the labels are in one place. And by using resource qualifiers, you can, you know, substitute another language. Or you can even do things like if there was a description of something, if the screen size was smaller, you could have a short description. If the screen size is bigger, you could have a long description. All right. So you can really, without changing a lot in your code, you can really customize it for different platforms. Let's start out looking at the strings file. All right. Pretty much the same as one we've seen with one difference. All right, strings, name, hello, simple tip calculator, app name, breakfast, breakfast, calculate, calculate tip. The one difference is that we have a string array for the levels of service, poor, average, and excellent. What do you suppose that's going to be used for? Why is that an array instead of having individual strings for that? So you can put it in the drop down. I can say this drop down gets its values from this array. And without me having to code and individually add those elements in, I can just add all those um, all in one swoop. All right, so that's something a little bit different that we did not do in the previous example. All right, let's look at. And that's in XML coding, right? If that was in Java, the drop down or the array would look different, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's been like four semesters since Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we have our layout. Our main XML. And if we look at it, see right off the bat, the root node's a little different. It's no longer a relative layout, it's a linear layout. Now linear layout, linear line, means that the things are going to be simply in a line, one after another, boop, 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 right down the line. Now you can orient it horizontally or you can orient it vertically. In this case, I'm orienting it vertically. So. The first thing, the label that says simple ta ta tip calculator is on the top. The text box is underneath that, underneath that, underneath that, underneath that. All right? Just a linear layout. I could, um, you know, orient it horizontally, but in this case, the stuff wouldn't fit. Now, one thing that you'll see with these layouts is just sort of like um, HTML, we can nest these layouts. In other words, I could have a linear layout of thing one, thing two, thing three, thing four. Thing five could actually be a linear layout oriented horizontally to put three things side by side horizontally and so on. So these are get to be pretty involved, all right? But for now, we're starting off and pretty straightforward. We have a text view, which is text that the user cannot enter into. And we have an edit text field. Uh, that is the text where the user can enter in. So again, the one is a label that says the name of the program. The text is the one where you can enter the amount. Notice I say input type is number. All right. When I do that, I don't get the full keyboard, I just get the number pad. All right, when I'm in that text box. And that's a nice feature. A couple other things that are different. This spec I specify the width of this as being 100 dp. So I'm using density independent pixels. I'm using an ID for it, which will come in handy later on. All right, so because we have to write some code to grab that value from there. And I put in a, a, a tag to say request focus, 
What do you suppose that does for me? Well, it puts the cursor in this field. In other words, this field is asking to get focus. Focus on me, focus on me, all right? What that means is put the cursor in this field if you can, all right? And therefore, when... Blinking cursor, right? Pardon me? Talking about the blinking cursor? Yeah, I'm talking about the Android cursor. In other words, when this app fires off, the cursor's already in that text field as opposed to being on the drop down or one of the other places. Yeah, can you the request focus, I'm assuming that means if it can be done. Yes. If you put just focus, does that force it to do it? No. It no. I is not there not that I know. Of focus? Repeat please? Is there an option for forcing? No. No. Not that I know of. You don't want to blow the thing up. Make it mad. Right. Keep it Keep in mind that, that your, your application is running within a whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you're asking Android to give you, you focus. Android might have something else going on that it's not able to do that. Here's your spinner control, which is a drop down. And again, notice that the entries come from that array. All right, if you remember, we had an array called level of service. That's where we had the list of the three possibilities for service. We have a prompt then that will be the heading of the drop down. We have a checkbox. We have label associated with the, the, the uh, uh, checkbox. Then finally, we have a button and we have a text view where we're going to put our answer. So we're starting to broaden our palette of views. How many views are there? There's a lot of them. All right. You know, we start out with the basic ones, buttons, spinners, checkboxes, um, text views, which are like labels, edit text, which are like text boxes, and so on down the line. All right, now to the activity and I'll bring this code in here. Where did you uh, download the tip calculator from? There's a deed. Uh, there's a there's a Deedle tip tip calculator from their website. Right? From their website, well, yeah. Because I did, I got a totally different calculator. Yeah, this is my example. I'll oh, upload okay. this example today. Okay. Yeah. All right. We may. I don't know. What about twenty minutes left, give or take. We may spend all our time on this line of code. <laughs> all right? Must be an important line of code, eh? It is. All right? This is our Java, and it's similar up to this point. All right? What does super on create mean? Yeah, it's calling, in other words, this is the onCreate method of this activity. It's calling the parent's onCreate activity because the parent may have some stuff to do too. So when this app is created, in addition to doing the stuff this app needs to do, we want the parent class to do all the stuff that the parent needs to do. So we call super and call the same method. We'll see that in several places. Saved instance state relates to if you're, and again, this gets a little confusing, and we'll cover this more as the semester goes on, but there's a difference if you open up an app 
and then if you simply go run another app and then come back to this app. Okay. So All right. It for a yeah. And again, we'll go over that in more detail. But as I click on that again, oops, clicked on the Deedle Tip calculator. When I click this, notice that the stuff is back there. So this gives a potential to handle save stuff that you have. Now, and this sets the content view, which again says, hey, grab that layout file from main, use the one appropriate, using whatever resource qualifiers are out there to pull it up. Now, let me write this up on the board. Button, or actually I won't write it up on the board, but I will isolate this and put it in its own text file so we can look just at this. equals button find view by ID r dot ID dot calc. All right, let's break this down and let's start with the left hand side of the equal sign and then let's look at the right hand of the equal sign. What does this say by itself? Create a button and name it calc. All right. This is saying I have a button object. I want to create a variable. All right, for, and the variable's name is going to be calc. And what am I going to put in that variable? I'm going to put a button in that variable. So that's what button calc is. It's very similar to the syntax you see in C Sharp. It's, it is Java, so it's the same syntax as Java. But this essentially is a variable declaration. All right. Button is the name of the class. Can someone define what a class is? A class is a, a collection of state, or, or a collection of methods, properties, variables, everything that makes would make a specific thing. Okay. Kind of like a blueprint. Okay, a blueprint? Yeah, blueprint. So, so All right. Uh, it contains attributes. I'm not sure the exact words you use. I think you said attributes and methods. Uh, or properties and methods. Properties, properties and methods. Properties are characteristics. In other words, what would be a characteristic of a button? Well, the text on it, the color of the button, size. the size of the button, and so on. And then there can be some methods associated with a button as well. All right? When I say a class, I'm talking about a template, a blueprint, that describes how every member of that class is going to act. All right? We're creating a software model of something. And in this case, we're creating a software model of that physical button that's displayed on the screen. All right? What's the difference between a class and an object? object is an instance or is a member of that class. All right, if we were talking just in non-technical examples, all right, a class would be human, human being, all right? Now, human beings, each human being has a set of properties and methods that are common to all human beings, all right? Every human being has a birthday, right? Every human being has a height. Every human being has a weight, and so on down the line. It has a blood type, all right? And we can go on down the line. So there's things that are true for humans, 
and again, I'm focusing on attributes, but we could also talk about um, behaviors that humans exhibit. All right. Um, doesn't count for all human beings. All right. Is an object only a member of one class? No. How can an object be a member of two classes? Can you give an example of that? You know, the two classes share the same object. So the height of a human and the height of a monkey. Okay. Well, I mean, the uh, the class is uh, always the object as uh, belongs to a class, and that class is a subclass of a subclass. Okay. Uh, one example, like, I come from computer game programming background. So yes. I did a character on the screen. He had a mobile attached to him that let him move. Okay. Okay. It has a bunch of different classes that each did something on their own, but combined. Okay. That's an interesting point. Um, that sounds more like this class having as a property an object of another class. All right. In other words, your character wasn't a mobile. It had a mobile. It would be like if we were developing an automobile. All right. We could say that an automobile is comprised of a steering wheel, an engine, tires. Each one of those could be their own class. But an automobile is not a tire. An automobile is not a steering wheel. All right. So that's a little bit, and that can be coded a couple different ways. And that's an interesting one, and it's definitely true. What I'm talking about is everyone in this class is a human. But also, everyone in this class is a student. All right? So that's a case where you belong to two classes. All right? And that's going more on a more specific le uh, uh, level, right? Because everyone in this class is a human. But more specifically, each one of you is also a student. All right? We could go more generally, too. Everyone in this class is also a mammal. Everyone in this class is also a animal. Everyone in this class is also a living thing. All right? And at each of those levels, there can be a set of properties and methods that apply for all members of the class. Yes? Right, because if we were drawing the diagram, Venn diagram. No, not a Venn diagram. Hierarchy diagram. Are you talking about inheritance? Talking about inheritance, exactly. Something that's living. And again, my biology could be a little off here, but work with me here. Near as I remember from 10th grade biology, when I think, I don't know, that, you know that, I don't even know if Homo sapiens was around then. I think, you know, we were still Neanderthals back then. But anyhow, you have living things, can be plants or animals. Animals can be fish, birds, and so on. Mammals Sometimes they call subclasses and superclasses specialization. All right? Because what is a human? Well, as a student, 
I'm sorry, what is a student? <laughs> it's a human that has some extra properties and methods. All right? Students enroll for classes. Students apply for graduation. Students get grades. Students have a GPA. Students have one or many majors, and so on down the line. Now, let's talk about things that we could ask. All right? Every living creature, I think, again, we could say has a birthday, right? Students have a GPA. Humans might have a driver's license number. Let's say that's one of the attributes that we are storing, or a social security number. And don't forget some cats have actually had uh, funny cards to get all their names. That's not a social security number or a driver's license. All right. Yeah, but I haven't put that property up yet. All right. Now, in other words, can I ask a fish, thinking in object-oriented terms, what their birth date is? Yes. I mean, I wouldn't expect to get an answer, but <laughs> if I had an object for a fish, I could ask, what's your birth date? Because that property exists for all living things. So I could ask all plants. I can ask all animals. I can ask a fish, a bird, a mammal, a student, a human, a cat a dog, and so on, all right? What is your birthday? And that object should be able to respond. Can I ask a bird what your GPA is? No. Why not? Because that attribute exists on this level. So here's an interesting thing, all right? And this is known as polymorphism. Poly means many. Morphism means form. So when I say polymorphism, I'm talking about many shapes. One object can be seen as in many shapes or forms. All right? I can treat an object that is one instance of a particular class as any of the classes going up the chain. All right? So if I had a function that requires a living thing, can I pass that function a student? Yes, students are living things. If I have a function that requires a mammal, can I pass a student object in? Yes, because a student is a mammal. The test, one of the tests, and again, this isn't a class in object-oriented programming, but I think it's important to understand that, all right? Otherwise, some of these things are just going to seem like we're saying magic words, all right? As we go down, we can say is a, which as we go back up. A student is a human. A human is a mammal. A mammal is an animal. An animal is a living thing. And again, getting back to the credit card, holding cats, there's a couple ways we could handle that. We could make another class for credit card holders and have cats underneath that, as well as humans. Or we could make an interface, all right, and have an interface for credit card holders. Then we could give credit cards to anyone that implemented that interface. All right. But this is called the ISA. As you go up, a student is a member of all of these classes going up. And I can treat a student at any level I want to. All right? Now, here's a twist, a little twist. All right? I'm trying to think of a good example of this here. If I'm treating 
a student as a mammal. If I give a student object to a function that's looking for mammals, I can't ask for the things that are specific to students. Why? Because a function that's looking for a mammal doesn't know anything about GPAs. It just knows about mammal things. All right? So whatever attributes would exist on mammals distinct from other animals, I could ask any of those things. I could ask all the attributes on this. However, if there's a function that exists on the mammal level, and it exists on the student level, even if I'm treating it as a mammal, I get the right version of the function. In other words, what is your, what, okay, here's an example. What, what uh, again, what is your um, ideal blood pressure? All right, that's gonna be different from mammal to mammal, right? And there might be a little algorithm that you, that, that someone could calculate based on your age and your, height and weight and blah, 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 what an ideal blood pressure is. And it might be different for each animal, the algorithm to create it. If I called that method on a student object, even if I was treating it as a mammal, I would get the student algorithm for calculating the proper blood pressure. I doubt that the blood pressure would be on a student level, probably be on the human level, because I don't think students have different blood pressures than just the civilians, all right? But again, so regardless of, an object is an object. If I call a method on it, I'm gonna get the version of the method defined for that object. But if I'm treating it as a mammal, I can only call those methods that were declared here on up. Okay, what does this have to do with that mega instruction that I have up on the board. I said I have a, I'm creating a variable. Specifically, this is called an object reference variable because it's pointing to some object out there somewhere. So I have an object reference variable. It's gonna, it is gonna at some point hold a button object. And its name is calc. Find view by ID. And what am I giving it? I'm giving the r.id.calc. What do you suppose r.id calc corresponds to? It does. And exactly. In our layout file, if we look at this, Here's that button. What's its ID? It's called ID calc. So that is where I got this from. In the resources, an ID called calc. Find view by ID says I'm going to look in the content in the in the uh, I'm sorry in the activities main content view, which is that XML file, and I'm going to find the thing called r.id.calc. I'm going to find the thing that has that ID. What does this button in parentheses then mean? It's casting it. What does it mean? How would you describe what casting means? Okay. Yeah, and, I, and I, th I think you're. I think you're understanding it and declaring it or something. I guess the way I would say it is, I'm saying I want to make sure that I treat that like it's a button. So the thing that you find 
on the page or on the in the layout that has an ID of ID calc. I want to treat that as a button. All right. Why do I need to do, to do that? Because find view by ID is used to find any view on my layout. In other words, what views did we have so far? We had an image view, we had a spinner view, we had a, a, a text view, we had an edit text view, we had a checkbox view. We use the same find view by ID to find all of those. So later on in the code, there's going to be a line of code that's going to look for that edit text field where we entered the amount. There's going to be a... Um, there's going to be a find view by ID that's going to look for the checkbox to see if it was breakfast or not. There's going to be a find view by ID that looks at the spinner to see um, what the level of service was, poor, average, or excellent. Find view by ID finds just that. It finds a view. We're not content to do just view things with this control, right? Just like we can't ask a mammal what their GPA is. So if I'm treating an object like a mammal, I can't ask what your GPA is. If I tell the program that I want to treat this, however, like a student, I can ask a student what their GPA is. All right? And in this case, if I tell the program declares that the view that you find is a button, so treat it like a button, then I can do button things to this. I can write code that handles what happens when you click on this. I can use all the properties and methods associated with a button to accomplish my goal here. So, in a nutshell, this statement says, I'm creating a variable of type button. I am causing that variable to point for the button in my layout that has an ID of calc. And because this method here, the highlighted method, all I can guarantee is that that method is going to return some view. All right? But I want to be sure that I can treat that view like a button. Therefore, I cast the results of this as a button. What would happen, by the way, if I used the wrong ID here and I didn't pull up a button and I tried to cast it as a button? Errors and yeah, it would It would blow up, exactly. All right. Again, it would say, you know, uh, you know can't cast this variable to this class type. All right. Interestingly enough, that would be a runtime error and not a compile error. All right. Because the compiler doesn't know what is what this view is. All right. It only at runtime will it be able to identify what that is and, and be able to do that. So now our variable called calc we know is a button. How do we know it's a button? Well, we created the UI and we stacked the deck. We made sure the thing called this is a button. Now I can do button things to it. And what's an example of button things? Clicking it. Clicking it. And how do we do that? It, we, we create a listener for it. Very good. So I can now do this. And we'll talk about this next time. What this is saying is because I know it's a button, I can tell and I can set what code handles when this button gets clicked. Because what do you do to buttons? Well, you click them. All right. So I can set a listener that is the code that's going to handle when this button gets clicked. All right. I can do that because I made sure that it was a button and I cast it to a button. If I didn't do that cast, I wouldn't be able to do this because only some views have click listeners. 
Not all of them have click listeners, but a button does. Yes? What is this? Okay, this means whatever object we are referring to. Okay. So in this example, I hate to use the word this, but in the example I'm talking about now, this is actually the activity object. Okay. So what I'm saying, essentially, in a nutshell, is that this activity object contains the code that's going to handle what happens when the button gets clicked. So the this is referring to the container that it's in? Yeah, it's, it's whatever object that code is in. Okay. All right? So you can reference um, some other uh, source for the uh, code if you want to. Yes, you can. And we'll see, we'll see a bunch of different ways that you can do this. There's a whole bunch of ways that you can always, do this. I've always been confused as to what this right. is. Right, yeah, this and means I this. Never <laughs> in fact, in this case, we can see that right here, that onClick method is part of the same class. So what that is doing is that saying, hey, when that button gets clicked, call this onClick method. Yes? The super dot uh, on create uh, uh, would that be considered recursive since it's calling itself? Or is that a C-sharp term? It's not really calling itself. A recursive function literally calls itself. Yeah, That's know. calling its parents function. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because the super class. Because the super, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. If that, it wasn't there, then it would be calling itself. Yeah. yeah, right, right. Yeah, a true recursive function calls itself. This is, this is like, um, this is almost like, um, like constructor chaining, where you can you can chain constructors together, um, except this isn't a constructor, this is a method. The idea is this, you have two choices. When you create a class that is a subclass of another class. If you don't do anything, you get all the methods in the superclass as they exist. If you override a method though, you get your code but not the code in the super class. This is doing the best of both worlds. This is saying, hey, first do the onCreate method on the super class, then do my chunk of code. All right? If that method wasn't there at all, it would automatically do the super class. But because I've overridden it, all right, I, if I overrid it, it's not going to call the super class unless I explicitly say, um, go and do the method on the super class. All right. Next time we will pick up on the rest of this example.